everyone, it's Wilmer from the Game Academy School. In this episode, we'll start adding some entities to our top-down shooter. Now that we have a little spaceship, we can set up some obstacles, little asteroids, as you might expect. Then we'll make some systems to translate and spin them. We won't have collisions or anything like that yet, but this is a perfect time to introduce tags. Tags are simple components that help flag different entities for different behaviors. This way, a spaceship, for example, can act very differently from an asteroid. It's a super easy technique, so let's check it out. You could continue from the last video where we set up basic player input and movement or download the starter file from the link in the description. But you can really try this on any Unity project of your own. Just bring your own geometry and entities. For our packages, we're using the following versions. If you just import the hybrid renderer, the correct matching entities package should import automatically, and that in turn will import any other dependencies. Load up the tag scene to see what we're starting with. So far, we just have a single spaceship. It's a pretty basic player controller, but yes, it does work. By itself, it's no achievement, but the cool part about ECS and dots is how quickly you can scale up your game behavior. For example, let's say you wanted to have two spaceships, like that double spaceship effect from Galaga. Edit the player subscene, duplicate the space fighter and offset it from the original, maybe two and a half units, and watch the double follow the original round screen. There's no extra code required for this. You can add a whole formation of spaceships just by duplicating and offsetting. The entities for each queries all of the entities that follow this pattern, and the same process gets applied to each one. Now this is a silly use case, and probably you wouldn't do this, but I'm hoping it gives you an idea on Dot's workflow. An ECS system constantly polls all of the entities in the current world. When it finds an entity that matches these specific components, all of these input parameters must match, then it applies the logic down here. If there are other entities that don't match our input parameters, then nothing happens. To understand how all this works, we really need some more entities to work with. We're building an asteroids-like game, I suppose, so let's bring in some extra obstacles that we can fly our ship around. I found some free low polygon rocks in the asset store from Snowfiend Studios. They sort of fit with the art style that we're using in this demo. Import that, and here are my low poly rocks. Now for my spaceship, the rocks are a little bit small, so I'll go into the import settings for the various models and adjust their scale factor by two and a half. For my game, I'll just reuse the holographic material and go with a glowing monochromatic look. Just grab all the rock prefabs and set their material to the existing hologram matte material. Or feel free to make your own materials with a different color. Let's drop the asteroids into their own subscene. Right click over the empty space of the hierarchy. New subscene, empty scene. Let's save that to disk. I'll just call it asteroid subscene. In the hierarchy, Disable the Space Fighter game object in the Spaceship subscene. That'll make it easier to set up our asteroids. Just as in Unity Classic, it's usually a good idea to keep the mesh under a separate transform rather than moving it directly. This gives you some extra flexibility later. In this case, we want to make our asteroids spin continuously along one axis while also traveling forward. Create an empty game object called Asteroid and make sure it's underneath of the subscene so it will show up as an entity at runtime. Under that, drop one of our low polygon rocks. I'll try rock six, that one looks pretty cool. Unpack the prefab completely and rename it to rock mesh or asteroid mesh to make it more clear what it is. And as always, double check that you don't have any inadvertent transforms, just reset everything if necessary. And save the subscene. Because this is a subscene, everything within it becomes an entity at runtime. In this case, we have two game objects that convert automatically. Though our entities don't show up hierarchically, they can come with parent and child components. If you select the asteroid entity, you can see that the child field in the inspector could point to a collection of other entities. In this case, we only have one element, and that's the asteroid mesh entity identified by its unique index number. Likewise, the asteroid mesh has a parent component. An entity can only have one parent, and here the asteroid is listed, again by index number. Entities can refer to one another just by using a single integer. 
That's how ECS can create relationships between entities really efficiently. These parent-child components can imitate how we normally think of creating hierarchies with game objects and classic transforms. Thus, we only need to move the quote-unquote top asteroid entity to push its children along as well, even though there's no real hierarchy there. To determine how fast the asteroid will actually move, we'll need some data. And for that, we can reuse the move data component created in the last video. Again, you might remember that it's pretty simple, but it looks like this. Fields for the direction, speed, and turn speed. Drag the script onto the asteroid to make an authoring component, and then set its speed to something really slow. Try a value of one. And basically, that's our asteroid all ready for movement. Let's make a system to push our asteroid forward along its local Z axis. Create a new C -sharp script called move forward system, and then edit the script and adding your usual using lines, Unity entities, Unity mathematics, and Unity transforms. Inherit from system base, implement on update, get a reference to the time delta time, Remember, we can only get this from the main thread, so we'll need to store it in a float for use later. And below that, let's run our entities for each structure. This queries all of our entities, pass in a lambda expression, and we will invoke it with schedule parallel. This lets the worker threads assist if possible. We'll be running the same task over multiple asteroids. As we start getting more and more, Unity will spread the work out more evenly. Let's format our lambda and fill out the input parameters. In this case, the only component that we'll be writing to is the translation. So we pass that in with a ref, and we need read-only access for the move data and rotation components. For the logic itself, it could be a one-liner, but I'm going to break it up just for readability. First, we'll need to figure out the vector that points along the local Z axis of the entity's transform, and you get that with math.forward passing in the rotation value. Then you simply increment the current position, pause value plus equals, and we add the forward direction that we just got multiplied by the move data's speed. This gives you how much we move per second. Instead, we want how much we move per frame. So we multiply by delta time. If you save the system, then it's active. In play mode, look at that. Our asteroid is now moving forward along its local positive Z direction. To make the asteroid spin, make another system. Again, for control, we probably don't want to animate the mesh transform directly. Make an empty game object below the asteroid, but above the mesh. And we'll call this asteroid base. Get rid of any unneeded transforms per usual and drag the move data script onto the asteroid base and add one for the turn speed. This field will be used to control how fast the asteroid will spin. And now let's create a new c -sharp script and call that spinner system. We'll use that to drive the spinning motion of the asteroid base. Let's edit this and go to Visual Studio. In the spinner system script, add your usual resources at the top, Unity Entities, Unity Mathematics, and Unity Transforms. And this will, of course, inherit from system base. And we want to implement on update and clear out anything that we don't need. Add a float for the time delta time. And just like before, let's set up the skeleton of the entities for each with a lambda expression. And you can schedule this in parallel over the worker threads. The spinner system should only work on entities with rotation and move data components. Set up the lambda's input parameters. The rotation needs write access. The move data is read only. Now, once we have the input parameters, let's figure out the logic to rotate our entity for one frame. First, we define our current rotation as a quaternion. It's easy for a quaternion to get small floating point errors, so we normalize it to avoid any precision problems. Quaternion normalized rot equals math normalize, passing in the rot value. And then we'll determine another quaternion for how much we actually want to rotate on this specific frame. Quaternion angle to rotate equals quaternion axis angle. Axis angle takes a vector to be used as the axis of rotation and an angle expressed in radians. Then it returns the equivalent quaternion. The axis I'll take from math up, that gives the local positive y defined in world space. 
Now this will make the asteroids all spin clockwise along the local y-axis, and then we pass in the move data turn speed. That's defined in radians, and we're using this completely differently than how we're using it on the player. That's okay, but I'll just set our default speed to 1, so that'll be about 1 radian per second, not quite 60 degrees. We want how much to rotate per frame, so we just multiply by our float, delta time. Once I have those two quaternions, we just multiply them together using math multiply, rot value equals math.mul, passing in the normalized rotation and the angle to rotate. And that's how we slightly turn our entity on each frame. Save the spinner system and let's check out how it affects our asteroid. Let's go to play mode and success. We have our asteroid spinning in addition to moving forward in positive z. Of course, the way that we've designed this, we want the asteroid entity to translate and the asteroid base to rotate. But there's nothing actually enforcing that except for the values that we've set up in the authoring scripts. The turn speed of the asteroid is zero, so that one can't rotate, but the spinner system is actually trying. It runs on every entity that has a rotation and move data component, so this one actually qualifies, but with a turn speed of zero, it can't really turn. Likewise, the asteroid base would normally be translated, except that we have zero for the speed here. So same thing, we normally would translate except for the fact that this value is zero. If you put any non-zero values in there, you probably would get some unexpected results. And that's really part of the workflow with using entities. We get the efficiency of ECS processing a whole number of entities at once, but we need something to make sure that only certain entities are affected by certain systems. We can see this illustrated more clearly on our player's spaceship entity. Let's shove our asteroid over to the side and let's re-enable our player from the other spaceship subscene. Save the file and let's go to play mode. At runtime, our player spaceship now continuously thrusts forward without doing anything. You can still control the ship, but it's pretty wonky. And that's because the spinner system is kicking in every time you try to turn. So the controls feel, well, even more terrible than they were before. Fortunately, we can fix all these things with tags. Tags are just a simple way to reuse components to classify your entities. I'll make a subfolder under scripts to keep them together, make three C-sharp scripts. They're just going to be components, but I'll differentiate them by naming convention. Instead of calling them data at the end, I'll use the suffix tag. I'll call mine player tag, asteroid tag, and spinner tag. Effectively, they will behave like the built-in tag system with game objects, except this works with entities. Edit each c -sharp script, and you really only need the Unity Entities resources for each one. And the great part is that tags are super simple to set up. Just implement iComponentData, make it a struct, add the generate authoring component attribute, got the contents of the struct, and that's it. Tags are completely empty components. Easy. Just repeat this process for all of the tags. Once you have your tag components set up, drag them onto the appropriate game objects in your scene. The spaceship gets the player tag authoring component. The asteroid game object gets the asteroid tag authoring component. And the asteroid base gets the spinner tag authoring. Enter play mode just to confirm that they're there. And we should have the various tag components in the entity debugger. They're just empty extra components. Now at the moment, they aren't doing anything just yet. To utilize them, we need to add some filters to our various systems. Every time we use the entities for each structure from system base, we're running an entity query for use with our Lambda expression. You can filter the results of your query with some clauses to refine your search. The basic filters include with all, with any, or with none. And there are more, but these are the basics. With all means that we only apply the logic to entities with all of the components specified. With any means run the logic on an entity that contains any of these components. And with none, make sure that we don't run the logic on any entity that has any listed component. 
To use any of these filters, we just apply them right after the entities and before the for each. You'll just drop in the component types inside of angle brackets with parentheses afterward, similar to calling a generic method. And you can combine these filters for different results. In this example, we would only run the system on entities with the local to world component, but without the local to parent component. And any entity would be required to have a scale, translation, or rotation component, any one of those for the logic in the Lambda expression to run. The other filter that you should be aware of is the input parameters of the actual Lambda expression. They also act like with all filter. We need all of these components present or else the expression does nothing. Let's take our spinner system and modify it with filters. We can make sure that we only run the spinner logic on entities that have the spinner tag component. And I can use a with all or with any passing in the spinner tag. Now, if for some reason you added the spinner tag to the spaceship and you wanted to ignore that explicitly, you could also do this with none, player tag, and optionally, you could drop in the spinner tag in the input parameters of the Lambda. That's another way to run the same filter, but you can't have the with all filter here and the spinner tag in here as well. It would spit out an error that you're applying the same filter twice. So one or the other. You can open up the other systems and selectively apply their logic to specific entities. For the move forward system, we want to affect asteroids, but not the player. You could simply add a with all asteroid tag or with any asteroid tag, since we only have the one component. Now, if you wanted to exclude the player explicitly, you could also add with none player tag. You could also edit the player input system and player movement system and explicitly add filters there as well, but it's unlikely that you would add the input data component to a non-player entities, but you could add the filters just in case. If you enter play mode, you now have the systems on the asteroids no longer impacting the player. We can steer our ship without any repercussions from the spinner system or the move forward system that we just created. So we have the same somewhat not so great controls, but completely independent because of our tags and filters. Now, the great part about ECS and dots is that everything scales up enormously quickly. In my asteroid subscene, I could duplicate my asteroid game object and then position the duplicates around the player. You can rotate the asteroid transform and that determines which direction is the positive local Z axis. So what we'll do is just duplicate our asteroids and make a whole bunch of them and then arrange them around the player. Go ahead and swap out some of the rock meshes. Now remember that you can also rotate the asteroid base and the rock mesh to offset how the asteroid spins so there's a little bit of variation. Just be careful that you don't translate the asteroid base or rock mesh by accident. Then it would look like your asteroid is in a small orbit around something instead of simply spinning about its local axis. Okay, now after a little bit of cloning and repositioning, it starts to resemble some kind of asteroids game now. Now we can't make our entities collide just yet, either the ship with the asteroids or the asteroids with themselves. In the future, we'll cover dots physics and extra aspects of working with our little mini game, like spawning asteroids more procedurally or implementing some shooting mechanics, but we'll have to save that for another episode since we're out of time. Now, until then, make sure that you sign up for the mailing list to be notified about the full DOTS course when it's available. And of course, don't forget to check out our classic projects in the meantime. All right, thanks for watching. This is Wilmer. Until the next one, I'll see you in the game academy.